Hello and welcome back to uh, Flick by Flick. <laughs> I had to remember which show we're on. Uh, starring Oliver Luddy, myself. And, and Joe Kelly, myself. And today, or tonight, or, well, this evening, we're here to bring you the goss on two of the latest releases. One major, one a little bit more obscure, isn't it? Mine, I think it came in at, like, 17th <laughs> in the box office. Peaked UK at box 17th. office, yeah. So it's really making waves. People love it. So that one is Avengers, of course. Yeah, Avengers. Uh, a is. bit, a bit of a step down. Yeah, usually, yeah. usually Marvel are pretty good in the box office. But I think finally everyone had seen what they wanted to see, did not they? I think so everyone, everyone assumed that out. it was the end when Thanos won. Yeah. Them. Oh, spoilers! Oh, Why would you do that? Shit! Um, so the two films that we're going to be discussing today, the two films we've both seen, are Dragged Across Concrete, which is directed by. S. Craig Zala. Your, one of your up and coming sort of, uh, you know. Yes, hopefully. Of the <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah. we'll I'll, get I'll into explain that. my complicated relationship um, with S. The Craig. And uh, Avengers Endgame, directed by Disney Boardroom. Or who, who did direct it? <laughs> the Russo. Oh, it was the Russo. Of course. <laughs> the auteurs. The, the good Marvel directors. Yeah, right? they, they, they're good. Yeah. No, I'm not joking though. Wait, why did you make that <laughs> cynical Disney board guy? You can't see that. Disney smiling. care about us. Yeah, they do. Look at all this money that they've given us <laughs> to say that we've that Avengers was good. Um, and then we've also seen a few films individually. Yeah, so we? what have you seen that's that's new? Um, not so new, unfortunately. These are films which would have probably fit into our March roundup, but I saw Shazam, a superhero film directed by Warner Brothers Boardroom. <laughs> I can't remember who directed that, but... It had um, a director. It had a director. Films have directors. It pro was probably directed by a human. And Missing Link, which I also don't know the director to. Um, Do your research, I kid. know, yeah, sorry. I, I haven't had much time recently. Um, I mean, I've only seen one film, um, in addition to the ones we've seen. I saw Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, which is the Zac Efron is that the actual Ted title? Bundy film. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's, the, that's the title. It's one of those films I keep where I, I keep thinking of Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. <laughs> I, I did, it's an awful title, but that's directed by Joe Berlinger. I googled of it. Don't know. Which one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's his name. That's his name. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most you can say about him. That is his name. I, it is by a director with a name. And that name is Joe Berlinger. Yeah. Berlinger. Berlinger. My name is so, Joe Berlinger. So those are the films we're going to discuss. But first, a little quiz. Well, it's not a quiz. It's just a question. Um, what I've settled question. on is Avengers, which we're going to talk about, ends with an almighty battle scene. But for my money, not the best battle scene. Oliver, what are your favourite battle scenes in oh, films? Oh, I... Not to get yes. too early into Avengers talk, but that was one of the weaker parts for me. I never really yeah, well, liked that, that's, big that, that's the battle idea. scenes. Me too. But um, but this is the thing. I can't... God, what would you say is a, a big battle scene that you've loved? Um, I'd say maybe some of the Star Wars ones, I guess, are probably ones that stand out to me a bit more. Like which ones? Sort of the uh, like the space sort of dogfight. Well, it's not even the same thing. You're talking army about against army, aren't you? Yeah, I'd say that. So maybe the Battle of Hoth in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, that's pretty good. Pretty exciting. With all the, uh, but even that's the giant walking too... camels. I I think that's the thing. I I can't. <clears throat> None spring to mind, and you know that I'm not a huge Lord of the Rings junkie, so that. Yeah, to be fair, there that's like the Battle the of Helm's that, Deep is yeah. pretty is pretty damn good. Um, but yeah, that's why none really come to mind. I, I'm just not really into scenes of that. I, I like sort of character against character. You're an intellect. Um, no, no, sure. that's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm the complete opposite. I'm not intellectual enough to take in more than one two characters <laughs> going going at it at once. Um, what would you say? Good question. <laughs> Back um, in Helm's Deep. To be fair, the, the one that the one that first comes to mind, even though I think it's a very flawed film, um, I do think Braveheart has. Very I did good think about Braveheart sequences. It's interesting that we're going to talk about Mel Gibson because, as a director of big battles and violence, 
he's pretty good at that. Yeah. He makes it very immersive. I guess, well, uh, only a couple of months ago, I watched Saving Private Ryan. And I, I, um, mm. I don't know, would you call the opening of that a battle scene? It's more of a... It is kind of a preface. Incredibly. To, yeah, yeah. I think like anything, like I when I hear the word battle, I think it depends what you're looking for. Some you're, you're kind mm. of looking for fun and exhilaration like the Avengers one. Personally, I like the ones that are really grisly and horrible to watch. Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure there are ones... That make me emote, you know? Hmm. Like I say, I, I mean, sort of scanning over my favourite films, I can't think of many sort of huge skirmishes. Yeah. Gladiator's <laughs> so, 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 got some good ones. Would you... Yeah, but that's more like arena... Uh, oh, no, 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 you're talking about, like, the beginning, aren't you? The beginning's good, yeah. Um... Yeah, I just n I, all of these scenes that we're talking about are good, but they don't like stand out to me. Mm. I suppose it's like you, you'd probably have this if if I said to you, "What's your favorite car chase in a film?" Would you have the same thing where you're like, "They're all great, but there's not." Oh really no, there are ones that on. that stand out car yeah. chase wise, like the opening the of Drive, the one in T two. Oh yeah, that, that's cycle. very good. The opening of Baby Driver, I think, is a yeah. great. Is a great scene. The truck at the end of Mad Max Two. Oh yes. All all of Fury Road. <laughs> there was another car chase that I watched recently. Isn't Blue Bro Blues Brothers one of your favourite? Oh, Blues Brothers. Yeah. yeah, that's a very different one. Yeah. Comedic. They go for a shopping mall. Yeah. Jokes had by all. <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> Toy Story has a good car chase. Nobody else. As in the sides. the end of Toy yeah. Story. That's move, quite a classic sucking. moment, though, when they're flying through the air, isn't it? After the, yeah, the, the whole Lauren. scene's great, yeah. Did I, did I, I tell you about the live... It. There's a live-action remake of Toy Story on YouTube that someone did with, like, real toys and things. Oh, yeah, how did they do that scene? Um, that's very impressively. I think they use... I mean, a lot of it's quite amateurly done, but um, they use a lot of sort of visual effects and sort of manipulation to get it done. Oh. I think they rented out, like, a truck and decorated it like the one in the movie. Oh, shoot. Um, and they must have... The bit where the dog gets... Do you remember, like, the, there's, like, a car collision where the dog gets trapped? Uh, vaguely. That's how they get, get him off their t trail. Yeah. Um, they must have gotten, like, neighbours or friends to help them out with that because they actually do that. They actually have a oh. dog, like, all these cars, like, coming together and getting jammed on this uh, crossroads and the dog getting... Ah. Yeah, it's quite impressive. I'll have to check that um, out. But, maybe, yeah. Maybe link that in the... Yeah. Anyway, we're Something. getting we're getting off topic. Sidetracked. Um, okay. I, so in, the, in short, I have no answer for you whatsoever. And <laughs> neither do I. <laughs> this has been an unqualified success. <laughs> Should we talk about the films? Yeah, yeah. So, so are we starting with Dragged Across Concrete? Dragged Across Concrete. I can't seem to get that title up. Yeah. This evening, it's I? it's a weird title, isn't it? It is. It's it's almost like that Zac Efron film. High School Musical. Extremely yeah. loud and incredibly close to being vile and shocking and scary. <laughs> Disturbing. <laughs> oh. Um, okay, so, yeah, we watched Dragged Across Concrete, the third film by S. Craig Zahler, who I'm, yeah, still very excited about. <laughs> His first film was Bone Tomahawk. Which, which you went crazy I over. absolutely love. I mean, that's one of my... One of my favourite films, certainly of the last decade. It is a really good genre Maybe bender. ever. Gen 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 <laughs> genre bender. Genre bender. Yeah. But it's just about as up my street as like a film could be. And yeah. I really think that that film is like very intelligent, very thought through. I'll talk about it more later. He then directed Brawl in Cell Block 99, which you haven't seen. No. Um, which is also good. I don't think it's as good as Bone Tomahawk, but... Um, Again, very well. I got received. a slightly wider release. Yeah, it did, and I yeah. think it, it it attracted more attention because it was such a kind of an against type role for Vince Vaughn. Yeah, yeah. Or at least it was bringing back a kind of performance that we haven't seen him do in a while. That's the thing; he doesn't do them often, but he's always no. seems to work well in those sorts of roles. He's very, very good in it. And you know, we'll discuss that with this in a moment. Absolutely. So this is his third film, starring Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn as the leads. It kind of opens with these two detectives who basically carry out like a low-key drugs bust in an apartment. Um, Gibson's character is incredibly rough with the man they're arresting, pressing his foot against the man's face, being very violent. They're equally kind of despicable to the suspect's Latino girlfriend, yeah, yeah. who I think she's half deaf, and they kind of bully and harass and humiliate her. Yeah. 
I um, thought she wasn't like uh, fluent in English. No, no, so. she's not. I was just saying, yeah, she 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 yeah. can't speak English, but I think they yeah. make something of her being half deaf as well, don't they? I thought that was like a mocking thing. Oh, it might have been actually. Yeah, yeah, that's how I read it. They were like, oh, did you hear that? Oh, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. It's not that. They, they clarify it earlier. Anyway. Whatever. Plot summary. Im- Im- uh, <laughs> irrelevant. And, um, yeah, basically, the, the first part uh, of this bus they do is recorded by an onlooker on camera. The two men are called into head office and suspended in order to appease the media. That's basically what's said. Uh, it also, um, meanwhile... Uh, we're introduced to an ex-con played by Tory Kittles who's just been released from prison and in order to support his drug addicted mother and his bright but disabled brother he has to get involved in this mysterious heist and then after that Mel Gibson's character wants to get involved in something similar and these two plots kind of very very gradually intertwine Mm. Um, well well, it's sort of like Mel Gibson wants to foil that heist so that he can obtain yeah. that money, basically. It's because a weird he feels, crossover of him yeah. keeping on with his job. And, you know, I think he has like a part sort of delusion about still uploading, the, uh, up, up holding the law. And yet, you know, he's kind of doing it for the money. Well, yeah, well. he essentially, he, he, he explains actually in, in a monologue that, you know, he... he you get the sense that he feels him and Vince Vaughn, after all their hard work, yeah. deserve yeah. Um, financial benefits, which they're not getting from the yeah. police force for mm. various controversial reasons, and yeah. therefore they get involved in this heist to try and stop it to keep the mm. money for themselves. That's basically that's mm. basically the plot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what did you think of it? Uh, it was a good sort of cop thriller buried away in a lot of sort of (laughs) inconsistent storytelling and sort of questionable politics. Like, it wasn't, you know, know, when you say that a film is political, immediately what comes to mind is something that is very loudly stating that it is one way or the other. Absolutely. Whereas I think what was problematic about this film was that it's clearly made with neutrality in mind. And yet it kind of leans, the, the way that it's, um, it deals with specific issues and what, the way it depicts certain people, it leans in a slightly sort of sort of right direction, doesn't it? Like right wing yeah, direction, yeah. yeah. Um, because like, like you say, especially in the first like 15, 20 minutes, there's this real sort of like bitterness about the whole sort of br- police brutality thing and like being PC and sort of snowflakes. And... Oh yeah, that that's very very clear straight yeah. away. You you you're introduced. I was yeah sorry. yeah. I, sorry, I I was just gonna say I was like in those first like twenty minutes. I was thinking I kind of hope that the rest of the film's not like this, where it's just sort of basically just people complaining, being like we can't do anything nowadays. Or, yeah, or and it's not really you know they <laughs> use that and you and you think that's sort of an accurate depiction of those characters, but it, it feels kind of on the nose to a certain extent. Very on the yeah, nose. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, the opening scene, you're introduced to these two characters and they do this drug bust and they're completely despicable. Mm. Uh, like, that they... They, but it almost plays it up for laughs, doesn't it? Like when they're when they're. Um, it's a it's a very very that. dark humor yeah. which runs through I think all three of S. Craig Zala's films. There, right. There's there's comedy and like extreme violence. Yeah. Um, like like they, when they go hand in hand for all three of these yeah. films. It's never walked like a more risky tightrope. Because that's than the it thing. Yeah. Like like when they're questioning that um, the Latino woman, and. There was actually like someone in our cinema that like laughed at some of the stuff, and, I, and I'm thinking this is like, to me, this film is depicting it in like, you know, it's trying to make you not like these people, in that they're yeah. just like basically being abusive to this. You woman. can never, you can never trust, and then, you can never judge a film based on what people, how people react in the audience. That, well, no, I think you can because then you can see how people are going to read it. You know, there are there are ways that people mm. that things are portrayed on film where it is given a very clear narrative so that you can only 
you, you get a specific feeling from it where you're like, okay, this is not funny. If you think of something that's quite brutal in film and you watch that and you think, okay, that's not something to be taken lightly and you can think most people will read it that way. So I find it interesting when that happens and I'm thinking, man, these guys are assholes. And then there's someone like sat down. We, we went to see this together. Um, there's someone like sat like diagonally from us who like lets out like a genuine laugh of like, ha, ah, they're messing around with her. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I guess. I what, do think it says. I guess what I mean. About... It does. I guess what I mean is it, it, it. I don't think that is a good indicator of the intentions of like the filmmaker or the intentions of the. Maybe production. not the intentions, but but it, the effect it has on yeah, people for sure, yeah. definitely. Um, I mean, like, I, it's just the example. Like, I, I think back to like the Roger Ebert review of "I Spit on Your Grave." Mm. And and his review is so heavily catered towards how people are responding to him in the cinema. Like I mean, yeah. for for those who don't know, I spit on your grave is it is essentially like this huge, extended rape scene. It was one of the video nasties from the nineteen eighties, and um, he like Roger Ebert hated the film. Um, said it was like vile, disgusting, and he was talking about how everyone in the audience was like cheering on the rape scene, um, and you know like just completely being like hungry for yeah. the violence yeah. whether it be the sexual yeah. violence against the woman or the revenge she exacts on the yeah. men um and and i watched the film and i was like okay dumb stupid lots of flaws not mature enough to take on this subject but i don't think i think it's quite clearly that for me, it was quite clear that Roger Ebert's view had been twisted by the people he had been in the cinema with. Right. And I think it's important to separate the two. Yeah, I just think, like, there's intention and then there's execution. Yes, you yeah. You can have, like, that's complete intentions. Right. Yes, yeah, sure. And then just the way you execute something means that it may not be clear one way or the other, which is sometimes mm -hmm. a good thing. We've talked about this, you know, ambiguity is one of, sort of the film medium's great strengths because, you know, you want different readings. But I think when it's like a political statement, that's when it gets a bit more troublesome. It's like... Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think the problem is that there's an uncomfortable balance with this film. In that on one level, like you said, I don't think um, the film wants to declare itself on the subject yeah. matter. Oh yeah, it's... no, no. It's quite, it tries to be neutral. Exactly. And it's presenting all these hot topics at the moment, like police brutality, racism, racial tension, the i this idea that is growing which is that like somehow like black people now have it better than white people because mm. of quotas and political correctness uh just all these like things that are, are terrifyingly still yeah. hot topics um in both the media and everyday conversation um it's okay like, obviously films should like tackle <laughs> things like this but at the same time i don't think the script and the dialogue is subtle or sophisticated enough to make that neutral approach work. No, no. And, and particularly in that scene where they're being disciplined, and it's like almost like sound bites, like Twitter is, sound yeah, yeah, bites, yeah. like Vince Vaughn says something yeah. like, I'm not racist, I did this, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And, and Mel Gibson later on, it's like, just because I don't arrest people politely, it doesn't yeah, mean. Yeah. And it's just, it ne I, for me, it needs to be much more intelligent and much more there needs to be much more unsaid to make these themes work right if you're taking a neutral approach yeah if that yeah. makes sense mm, yeah yeah leave it to the audience to sort of key, key mm. into which way it's going well that's fair um, I, I'll, I'll get my quick comparison to bone tomahawk out of the way <laughs> like because i i think bone tomahawk the reason i love that film so much is um it, for those who haven't seen it it's a it's like kind of a western slash horror film uh, so it has this kind of classical Western um, premise in which like four men from a small town in the West go on a rescue party because a few people have been stolen from their small town. And they go on this journey through this treacherous landscape. And it basically, in the end, they've been taken by these, these troglodytes, like these, these massive kind of weird cannibals and it just gets horrendously violent and they get completely sort of beating the shit out of mm. more horrible things happen um the and, same as a lot of glee in your eyes <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and i and i loved it um but for me that, that what was so great about that film is that that film was about this kind of very like 
classic white man colonizing attitude which is like mm. you know we're good we're civilized and we can go out into the yeah. wilderness and yeah. take what is ours we will bring civilization to yeah we yeah. we will make the uncivilized civilized and 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 you like those characters and you enjoy watching them and they're kind of good and they have values and they're nice to each other and yet the and yet the kind of arc of the film comes in that horrifically violent scene where one of them's like literally torn apart in a cave and then you kind of see it in all their eyes that they realize shit we don't have control of this this world isn't ours to control and the reason that film i think is so wonderful is because it makes that statement it makes that damning statement about these characters and yet they're still incredibly likable when you care yeah. what happens to them. Yeah. It's a much harder balance yeah. to pull off. And I think you need that levity and you need those likable characters yeah. in there. Whereas this, everyone's kind of equally it's, despicable. Everyone's kind of pigeonholed a little bit. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, but which is a shame because I think at the core, you know, like we say, that beginning section where it feels very rocky. And then I think later on, as it gets a bit more settled... Or at least I felt this. There's a not riveting, but sort of pretty, you know, tightly done um, like cop sort of thriller film in there. Oh, and absolutely! Like staking out this drug bus. Um, you know, it probably could have. It's two and a half hours long, isn't it? I think it was. Two yes. And a half. Um, probably didn't need to be that length, but equally, it didn't feel excessively long. Ironically, it doesn't drag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't dragged across the film projector, but um, that was that was better. That was good. <laughs> that was better than what you were thinking of. I just said dragged. I don't know. That must pretty be like, um, pretty low. Um, yeah, to be fair, we, we've talked. To, you know, we've we've talked a lot about how like I think the film is ideologically troubling, and mm. um, it seems like it's like genuinely trying to provoke audiences, and I don't think it's entirely successful. However, like all his other films, in terms of the technical execution, there's some absolutely fantastic things about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned sound design before we went in. He's, that's his like films are probably the highlight. Well, I was trying to find if it, there was a single sound designer. I looked at the sound department and it's loads of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for his films. He, he, let's just say, because it's the same for all three of S. Craig Zahler's films, king of sound design. Yeah. <laughs> because it's incredible. Yeah. Just like... Even for subtle details as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean... And and there's a br he establishes a brilliant relationship in all three of his films between sound and violence, and must, the reason the violence in his films has so much weight to it is because of the sound design, like really like crunchy sounds. Even like I, I don't know if you felt this way, like um, in Dragged Across Concrete, when like guns were shot. They somehow felt like louder, yeah, sharper. Shattering, yeah. it, it almost like felt like it was happening yeah. in the room, yeah. in, and and it and it just makes the situation yeah. that much more tense and that much more yeah. exhilarating. Yeah, very um, sort of uh, oh God, I had the word on the tip of my tongue. Very sort of uh, physical, tangible, tangible. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and and also the I thought the chemistry between Mel Gibson and uh, Vince Vaughn was pretty good. Yeah, they're both kind of they're quite similar characters, and yet you can see where they sort of differ in certain ways, and the friction that that causes between them. You know, they're both guys who are kind of struggling along under this sort of pretense that has been established, and yet you know, and, and they're both kind of wired in the same way as well. They're both kind of you know, on edge mm. almost constantly. But Mel Gibson is really sort of keyed in on this drug bust and Vince Vaughn is sort of following along and he, he is sort of, you know, there for some of it, but then, you know, certain things will happen and he'll start doubting himself and, you know. As he, yeah, mm. they, they definitely play on him being, I don't know if it's naive, naivety but like Mel Gibson is certainly a lot more world weary and, yeah. he, and he talks about how it's kind of, everything is a rigged game yeah. and that he needs to take certain actions whether they're ethical or not mm. to make sure him and his family are okay. I think Vince Vaughn's still we uh, weary but he's he's sort of he's like right at the end of the sort of fuse of the dynamite where he's like I could still get out of this. Mm, that's you right. Know, like yeah. he, he, you know he is very far along the line and yet he's still like I could probably get out of this and 
live a fairly straightforward life. Um, but he's like, yeah, he's quite embroiled in it. So it's still like, when, it informs everything he kind of does. And... Well, that was the thing. One of my favourite things about um, the film, actually, is I really liked that one scene where he was having dinner with his girlfriend. I yeah. thought she was really... In- I thought she was really interesting um, because she's like you see him in all these situations where he's quite a tough guy he doesn't Mm, seem to be intimidated by much and yet there's this kind of subplot I don't know how well it kind of ties in where he wants to propose propose to her but in the one scene where she's on screen I don't know what the actress's name is but um, she's She's on screen for a few scenes but yeah the only like extended scene yeah like interacts but she's really like challenging of him and it and it and it's interesting to see that context yeah yeah yeah. where he feels he feels nervous and he feels like he has something to lose yeah and i i think those scenes were the ones that kind of got me perked up (laughs) yeah i thought a lot of my favorite scenes were like him and mel gibson sitting in the car working out what they're going to do next, you know, watching these guys, because there are all these little interactions between the two of them. Um, like, like, I mean, maybe the most, mem- weirdly the most memorable scene in the film was when Vince Vaughn very slowly devours, like, a burger. This is like, is it the morning? You know, they've been sitting in this yes, car overnight. Yes, yes. Vince Vaughn is, like, devouring this burger for his breakfast. And obviously the sound design means that we're hearing every single crunch in absolute detail. Yeah. We watch him for like five minutes eating it and then he sort of finishes it and, you know, says something about it to Mel Gibson. He's like, yeah, I've been listening to you to like enjoy yeah. it for like half an hour or something like that. Yeah. And you know, just these like sort of bitter interactions between the two of them. Exactly. There's some of the, the interplay between those two. Uh, I, I also th- think the bit where they're about to drive past the the guys they think are going to do the heist so then Mel Gibson puts on a cap and glasses and then Vince yeah. Vaughn says like, just wow or something like that <laughs> yeah. like, a cynical way of putting yeah. down his disguise and doesn't Mel Gibson go back at him but like, like saying oh it's better than the like weird slick back hair that you're going to do yeah and yeah then he starts yeah. hairspraying his hair blonde and and those are the things like those little moments of clumsiness they're slightly I think it's probably a bit lazy to say Tarantino inspired but it's that same it is that same thing about um, people who are about to walk into an incredibly dangerous or violent situation and having these very very sort of casual yeah um, sort of banterful mm. um, moments kind of been them. here before but you know, mm. yeah but that's the thing it's interesting what you say what, what we said about the length though I do like that his film is really really take their time oh yeah yeah scenes pacing well well, yeah the scenes really really play out Mm. properly then and i think there's there's such a problem recently of uh uh, this refers to one of the films we'll talk about later um (laughs) where the scenes just end way before they should and and scenes before you even know like what you're meant to get out of a scene it's over and we're on to the next thing well it's more like the clearly the writer or the director has said Okay, we've this scene has served its like narrative function, so we end it here. Mm. But you could squeeze so much more out of that scene in terms of world building, in terms of character development, mm. in terms of just staying in that setting for a bit longer. Exactly. Um, but it, it gets wasted. And but, that's yeah, that's one really... thing that S. Craig Zala definitely understands. He he definitely knows how to kind of yeah just let moments play out and get the kind of character information across that he needs to i just think the problem with this is i i I don't think the script is anything like as sophisticated or subtle as it needs to be especially when we've seen him write bone tomahawk yeah which for my money i don't know about you i think is a much superior film (laughs) Much superior Much film, I was going to say. I, w- I um, do think it's a masterpiece. Yeah, I mean, me. th- there are... Um, this film, I, I, you know, I think it's paced fairly well, but I think scene by scene, our news programme, um, mm-hmm. there are some problems with it in terms of... So, like, the African-American guy who is sort of involved in the heist. The film feels like it's trying to portray him 
or it wants to portray him as equally as Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. Like, you know, oh, like yeah, the, as in... the final section of the film involves them, the three of them specifically. And yet, I don't think we get anywhere near enough exposure to that character. No, he, we need. he he, he kind the... of, it starts with him. Yeah. And then it's, the film seems fascinated with Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. And then he's kind of very gradually picked up yeah. again. Yeah. And then... And he, he, and he gets the most sort of cartoony of setups and payoffs as well. Like, like his earlier scenes are just like showing him with his, his family in this apartment. And it's like, he wants to get his son, you know, oh, no, no, not his son, it was his brother, brother isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, he, you know, he wants to get him out and sort of realising his full potential and he wants to get his mum away. And it just feels quite simplified. And then by the end, you know, the final spoilers, the final scene of him where he's got like this enormous apartment and it's like something out of again like a cartoon like he's he's spent all of his money on this amazing apartment he like walks into the living room and his mum's getting a massage and it's like how are you do doing today mum <laughs> yeah i'm doing great i'm getting a massage wow i'm again, gonna go though, and see my brother in the video games room where he's playing all the video games he's ever wanted again though that feels like deliberately provocative though but i don't yeah. know what purpose that serves <laughs> <laughs> it's again we're having this we're kind of having me. the same thing about under the silver lake i do feel like the, <laughs> these filmmakers are doing it deliberately but i, I but it, it just feels a it feels juxtaposed to the style of the rest of the film. That's the problem for me. Oh, it does. The ending was really, really yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh, especially because the um, the rest of it seemed so grounded and realistic. Yeah. To be honest, something you said just then, I think, kind of potentially gets to the heart of the problem, which is that there are so many uh, character-like contradictions and little bits of information that are just piled upon each other. So you've got like these these two white, pretty racist cops. Yeah, Mel Gibson has like a disabled wife and his daughter's been bullied and harassed by some black teenagers and then Vince Vaughn wants to marry a woman of colour as well and then <laughs> and then like there's the the other guy you're talking about like the black guy and he has a disabled brother and he's trying to care for him and it just feels like it's like piling these Jenga blocks of things that could annoy or provoke people or cause controversy. Right. And it's like more and more characters, more and more relationships they have with other characters, they throw in, I know that you had a problem with this, the woman who just had a baby who's involved with the yes, heist. Yes, that was the other thing I was gonna mention. But yet, I think rather than really developing some of those individual relationships properly, it just keeps piling on. Yeah, no, the, the, the woman is the other thing, so like, Probably halfway through the film, suddenly we cut to this woman. She was played by someone new, Jennifer Carpenter. Jennifer Carpenter. She's in uh, Brawl and Cell Block ninety nine. All right, okay. Um, so she, we we suddenly cut to this woman who is having like separation anxiety from her like newborn child. Yeah. Um, and like there's this like extended scenes. So we've been following like this whole sort of heist and sort of this 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 stakeout for about an hour so far and suddenly we cut to her and like have several consecutive scenes where she's trying to leave for work but she wants to go back and see her kid mm. and the, the dad is having to say no you have to go to work yeah and she goes to work and it happens she's ha working in the bank where the heist takes place and again spoilers she gets shot um as part of the heist and, it, and I, I think I mentioned this to you, it felt like the Austin Powers joke with the henchman, where it's like, oh, <laughs> like, oh this, this Since character... Since Dad left, Steve's been like a father <laughs> <Yeah>. to me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this character in the background has a family too. But it just doesn't... It's so abrupt that it takes you out of the film when it occurs. Also, one of the things I had a problem, problem with as well is that at first, I, I think when you said that, I was like, what that did successfully do is it gave like it added more gravity to that scene and to that loss but at the same time i in that case i have a huge problem with the fact that they then take another woman hostage yeah who's essentially treated like a slab of meat for the rest of the film yeah. she's in yeah. the, the back of the car she's kind of like she's like stripped like sexually assaulted 
and and kind of just like the most terrible things are done to her, and we never get her backstory. Yeah. We never it could know have been who the same she character. is. Exactly. And Maybe then, they were in, a, in an earlier script. Yeah, yeah, and then they decided to make it different. But I, I found like the treatment of her really, really troubling. The yeah. woman in the back of the yeah. van, very particularly as stuff. they'd they'd made this digression uh, with the other woman, mm. and again, the only possible. Pos well, not positive. The only possible explanation for that is that it's trying to provoke again. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, and I'm just bored of that. <laughs> Even then, it's like you know, you, the the two cops are quite concerned with getting her out safely at the end. So there's sort of like a heroism depicted there. Even though the film is sort of depicting her suffering over her like redemption. Exactly. It's like a sort of counterbalanced yeah it's, it's very it's very troubling i think in a in a film <laughs> well, it is because it's in, yeah. you know a film where it's like they're all like it's this massive shootout between a bunch of guys and they're all the most developed character and you have that you have one woman there who's like like the trophy just woman treat, well just <laughs> literally treated like a bit of me and like yeah. and yeah it, it's just un i think uncomfortable without much effect it doesn't there isn't enough justification for it mm. i don't think i mean you can probably tell from our discussion it's a film that you can enjoy for some moments and then other moments are very confusing and sort of yeah um, troubling I, it, I think it's deliberately upsetting but it's like what is the purpose of that is it is, is it particularly insightful in the way that something like Bernard Tomahawk yeah is? that that's that's where i'm kind of that that's where I'm at. I I think yeah. you you can have a film as grim as this, but I think it's I I think the the, the the key problem is that it it tries to be neutral about these difficult topics, and I don't think it. The intention is neutral, but the execution isn't. Yes, yeah. that's it. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, but yeah, again though, um, if if you don't kind of tend to read films with that that as as ideologically as we have, then certainly on a formal basis in terms of how the film looks how it's edited the sound design and the performances m most of it's very well done <laughs> but then is that a problem if someone goes in thinking I'm, I don't really think about this stuff and then they're just being fed all of this like <laughs> yeah, troubling I guess that is all these pr troubling politics okay don't see it I go see Bone Tomahawk go in knowing that it's going to be a provocative time and that you may not agree or disagree with everything that's on screen. It's... Yeah. Well, you won't agree with anything that's on screen. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know <laughs> well, who you I'm never talking know. to. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, it, if anything good comes from us talking about this, it's that go and buy Bone Tomahawk. <laughs> we both kind of came out and were kind of like, we're going to take have to take a little while longer to... to yeah, to I had it. no idea what I thought of it. Like, the second I came yeah. out, I was like, I think I didn't like it, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, it has to sit with me a bit mm. longer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was actually, listening to your opinion of it now, you seem to be slightly more positive on it than you were when it came out. Yeah, I, I, I think like... it's because the effect of it is, yeah. like I said, is is very upsetting. Mm. And and, it, and you feel almost slightly like bullied and derided yeah. by watching it, yeah, which I think yeah. is deliberate. Um, yeah. It, only it, has, this, stepping it back. has a real yeah. like tone of like, is tolerance enough in today's day and age? In a kind of dark, and that's portrayed in a very mm. dark and sort of grim way, you know. In, yeah. In, in how, uh, I mean, that's what I took from that woman with the, the baby as well, where it's like this one sort of like intimate, sort of um, very sort of caring side, with an intimate caring relationship in the film. Mm. And it just gets like blasted away. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you know, if any, if that served any purpose, it sort of sums up that theme of the film. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is another thing. Just, just, just quickly, like the, the guys who do the heist, these like these uh, three European guys are genuinely threatening in it, and that, yeah. that again is a positive for it. Like they're they're very very kind of brutal and scary. Yeah. Yeah. They're good baddies, really. Good villains. Speaking of good villains, uh, do we have any more to say on... No, let's talk about what we're all here for. So, what everyone's here for. 